just as he raised the Father and the Father in him, in order that they may be in us. May the grace of the Master, Yeshua, the Messiah, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, unbound to us. Amen. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to where are we started today. 98. 98. Ain't a mocha, a lima doho night, but ain't my assay head cup. Ma putum and cook a long on me, the women shut him out like a door, my door. A deny my luck, a deny my luck, a naive of the long by it. A deny oh, the almo ye taint, a naive or a bit of a shalom. A parahatani. A tea ball, dear Vincent, Tana, a hetty on. Tina come out, Yerushala Hayim. Tina come out, Yerushala Hayim. He that have the Daha Tahasa, new men and the Ramanisa, but the Hobo Nova Lahami. There's none like you tonight among the gods. There's none like you. Glorious and holiness, awesome and gracious. I'm sorry, that's the wrong thing. Um, and there's none like your deeds. God can rule eternally. Your human wants to rule generations. And I rule, rule, and will rule forever and ever. And I will be saved God's people. And I will bless God's people with peace. Merciful Father, favor is the open of goodness. We look the walls for your for we trust you only, you, ruler God on night, sovereign of worlds. We're going to stand up. By heathens are unfair of Moshe. Come on, Adonai, by Buddha, by Zerka, by Nisu, Mishanetha, Mithanetha, Kibit Yote, Te Torah, Kibit Yote, Te Torah. Udvar Adonai, Mirush Lahayim, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Laamo Yisrael, Bik Yudusha Atoh. Praise be the name of the Sovereign of the Universe, praise be your crown and your place. May your love for your people Israel last forever, and may the salvation of your right hand be revealed to your people in your holy house. Grant us goodness of the goodness of your light, and accept our prayer with mercy. May it be your will that we be granted a long good life, and may I be counted among the righteous, so that you will have mercy on me and protect me in all that is mine and all that belongs to your people Israel. You are one, the one who nurtures all and sustains all. You rule over all. You're the one who rules over earthly powers, and sovereignty is yours. I'm a servant of the blessed Holy One. I bow before God and for the honor of God's Torah at all times. Not in human do I trust, nor do I allow any angel, but the God of heaven, who is a true God, and whose Torah is true, and whose prophets are true, and who multiplies deeds of goodness and truth. In God do I trust, and in God's holy order name may speak praises. May it be your will that you open my heart to your Torah, and completely answer my heart's desires for those who are keeping Israel for good, for life, and for peace. Amen. Amen. 102. 102. <clears throat> All right. Page 102, I'll response. I'm <laughs> 
God's word to us. The Bible. Very good. And Eli, look at me. And that's why the Bible matters. Why? Because who said it? Jesus. Well, I did. Yeah. So understand, what do we call this book? The Torah. Very good. All right. Eli? I think you're getting a lot better with these questions. You're <laughs> <laughs> doing a good job. Okay. And my encouragement to you is to keep it up. Um, Eli, can I give him one? Okay. Oh, I see her now. Um, I can see her. Um, I, I see your hands are full, so I'm going to take it. All right. Understand that our children are the future. And in Messianic Judaism, you see, the problem is we have a very low retention rate. What do I mean by that? That means that we have a lot of first-generation Messianics, but not a lot of second-generation Messianics. And that was the real problem, because what we teach our children is it's all optional. The Torah is not about salvation, only Yeshua, which is true. But then what we do is we communicate to our kids that there's no real use or value, and next thing you know, there's no intergenerational Lador of Lador kind of thing. And so, what we have to do is teach our children, yes, our salvation comes through Mashiach and faith in him alone, but the Torah is still important. And this covenant was struck with our ancestors, and it has been given to, the, uh, to all people who follow him. And where do we play into this story? And so it is important, and it's important that we, that children know that they are not second class citizens, that they are, in fact, equal with us. Amen. Amen. Page 104, I think. Right? 104. 104. Oh, I just realized I might not feel the right page anymore. Um, let me go to my book. Today is Mishpatim. What does Mishpatim mean? Oh, I know we know this. Mishpat. Judgments. Judgments. Of what am I talking about? We're, in We're not in Mishpatim. I'm sorry. Guys, I've been practicing Mishpatim because I've never been bar mitzvah. And my my Torah portion is going to be Mishpatim next year. That's why I'm in Mishpatim. We're not in Mishpatim. Just pretend I didn't say that. Because um, I could see and sense the confusion as soon as I said that. I'm like, something I said is wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, let me just say, I'm getting my, I'm getting my formal education. And I always sing an Ashkenazi trope, but I'm learning now Sephardic talk, which is very different. And it's great because the guy I'm learning from literally wears a white robe everywhere. And like has this this, this beard that kind of looks like Yonatan's. And he's just the coolest guy, so uh, <laughs> just bear with me. Um, okay. Um, Sorry, I'm all over the place today. 103. Okay, I was on the right page. 
May you help shield and save all who seek refuge in him. And let's say amen. amen. Yes. Let us render greatness to our God and give honor to the Torah. As there is no Cohen, arise. Um, arise, Yonatan, and um, uh, Ben Avraham, in place of the Cohen. Blessed is he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Yonatan, you can say where you are if you want. Okay. You want to love the Which one do you prefer? Okay. Baruch and I have a rock. 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 I have a no chain of Torah. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Amen. Call Moshe et call Adahat Bene Israel, Bamar Elehem, Elehat Varim, Asher Siva Adanahai, Ba Asot Otam Shishet Yamim, Ta Asem al Kaha, Ugo Hashi. Yelefehem, a Kodeshavaha Shalaton, a Adonai Koho, Shahabo Malakaha, Yame, a Yam Yamot, a Yamit, a Yamit, a Laha Tav Ruhu, Kolba Ko, a Mishbatehem, a Yom Hashabahat, Vayomer Adan, a Vayomer Moshe, a Kol Adahat. And they just write a hell, a more Zehadva Hadavahar, a share see Vahi Yehe, the Amor Kakuho, a Matahem, Toratame, a Adanahai, called a Nadib Le Kol, a sorry. Oh, okay. Um, it ends with um, Malaka. Um, which I already said. So, all right. Um, so, Jonathan? Baruch Adonai Baruch Adonai Adonai Elohim Malakalon Asher Natan Lano Torah Demet Dehaye Olam Natupus Batuhenu Baruch Adonai Natan Hatsorah I really could use uh, some help here. And uh, today, we just all, my help happens to be out of town. So I'm just gonna do this informally. That'd be great. Um, let's go ahead and we're just gonna go through the highlights of this week's Torah portion. Would anyone like to come up here and help me read them? Tammy, thank you. So we're gonna start today in Shemot 35, one through nine. Moshe assembled the whole community of the people of Israel and said to them, these are the things which Anai has ordered you to do. On six days, work should be done, but the seventh day is to be a holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest in honor of Adonai. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. You are not to kindle a fire in any of your homes on Shabbat. Moshe said to the whole community of the people of Israel, here's what Anai has ordered. Take up a collection for Anai from among yourselves, anyone whose heart makes him willing, is to bring the offering for Anai, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, and fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incenses, onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ritual vest and the breastplate. Rule 35, uh, verses 30 to 35. Can you put it down? Moshe said to the people of Israel, See, Adonai has singled out Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Yehuda. He has filled them with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge concerning every kind of autisserie. He is a master of design in gold, silver, bronze, cutting precious stones to be set, wood carving, and every other craft. Adonai has also given him an Oholiath, the son of Aksimach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with the skill needed for every kind of work, whether done by an artisan, 
a designer, an embroiderer using blue, purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine linen, or a weaver. They have the skill for every kind of work and design. Shemot, Exodus 37, 17 through 20. This is called Menorah. He made the menorah of sugar. He made it of hammered work, space, shop, cups, lines of sour leaves, and flowers were of single meaning. There were six branches extended from its side. Uh, three branches of the menorah on the side of it, and three on the other. On one branch, there were three cups shaped like almond blossoms, a ring of outer leaves and petals. Likewise, on the opposite branch, a three cups shaped like almond blossoms, uh, a, ring of, a ring of outer leaves and petals, and a similar of all six branches extended from the menorah. On the central center shaft of the north were four cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with its ring of outer leaves and petals. <coughs> we made the altar for burnt offerings of acacia wood. Acacia wood. Seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide. It was square and four and a half feet high. He made horns for it on its four corners. The horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. He made all the utensils for the altar, its pots, shovels, Basins, meat hooks, and frying pans, all its utensils made of bronze. He made for the altar a plate of bronze netting under its rim, reaching halfway up the altar. He cast four rings for the four ends of the bronze grate to hold the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. He put the carrying poles into the rings of the sides of the altar. He made it of planks and hollow inside. Shemot 39, 2 through 7. He made the ritual vest of yeah. gold, of blue, yeah. purple, and scarlet yarn, yeah. and of finely woven linen. They hammered the gold into thin plates and cut them into threads in order to work it into the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and the fine linen crafted by a skilled artisan. They made shoulder pieces for it, joined together. They were joined together at the two ends. The decorated belt on the vest used to fasten it was of the same workmanship and materials gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finally twine linen, as Adonai had ordered Moshe. They worked the onyx stones mounted in gold settings, engraving them with the names of the sons of Israel, as they would be engraved on a seal. Then he put them on the shoulder pieces of the vest to be stones calling to mind the stones of Israel as Adonai had ordered Moshe. Next is Shemot, Exodus 39, 22 through 26. He made the robe for the ritual vest. It was woven entirely of blue, with its opening in the middle like that of the coat of mail and with a border around the opening so that it, may, it wouldn't tear. On the bottom hem, he made pomegranates of blue, purple, scarlet, and woven linen, and they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all the way around the hem of the robe between the pomegranates. That is bell pomegranate, bell pomegranate, all the way around the hem of the robe for service. 
as Adonai had ordered Moshe. All right, final portion, Shemot 41 through 16. And with this, we come upon the end of the book of Shemot, so we want to include all the final portion. I have not said to Moshe, on the first day of the month, you're to set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, put it in the ark with the testimony, and conceal the ark with the curtain. Bring in the table and arrange its display. Bring in the menorah and light its lamp. Set the gold altar for incense in front of the ark of the testimony and set up the screen at the entrance to the tabernacle. Place the altar for burnt offerings in front of the entrance to the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Set up the courtyard all the way around and hang up the screen for the entrance to the courtyard. Take the anointing oil and I bought the tabernacle and everything in it, consecrate it with all its furnishings, then it will be especially holy. I bought the basin and its base and consecrate it. Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Put the holy garments on Aaron, anoint him and consecrate him so that he can serve me in the office of Cohen. Bring his sons. Put tunics on them and anoint them as you anointed their father so that they can serve me in the office of Cohen. Their anointing will signify that the office of Cohen is theirs through all of their generations. <laughs> this week's parasha gives commands about Shabbat and about the command to refrain from Malachi, <clears throat> the work of creating. The rest of the parasha then describes the form of Malachi building the tabernacle. Thus, these two passages are linked. Even the creation of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is put on hold during Shabbat. The holiness of the tabernacle does not negate the holiness of the Shabbat. The Messianic community often wonders how much work qualifies as work. According to the passage, any work of creation, even building the sanctuary, is put on hold for Shabbat. This includes starting a fire. Making a fire was easy for the ancient people, yet it was forbidden. It was not the difficulty of the task that made Malachi, but the act of creating Likewise, God didn't struggle when creating the world, yet he still rested from work on Shabbat. Today, the uneasy activities such as turning on lights or driving cars should be avoided on Shabbat because they entail the work of creating. Yet there's another concept at work, and we should be aware of it, that concept being do what you can. We live in a community, just as we cannot worship in a temple, it's not always possible to live such a strict lifestyle on Shabbat. We live in a community where driving is necessary. We do not live within walking distance of show. We must also turn on lights because we have no windows. So we do what we can by being aware of the commandments, but knowing that God recognizes effort. For us, we curb our work and production and fill it with as much holiness as possible. Our efforts may not be complete and they may not be perfect, but God does not require absolute perfection. Instead, he orders us to simply do what we can and he will worry about the rest. So it's funny because the discussion of Malachi was taking place today right before we began our prayers. I told Tammy, I said, this was written beforehand, it is not written against what anyone here is saying. And because we were talking about the issue of, should we turn on car, or should we drive cars, should we turn on lights? And um, Cricket, you were saying that one should not keep Shabbat fully until they convert. That way, the conversion can be a real conversion, it can be a conversion of the heart, which is true. And uh, Bill and Carol, they'll start coming up. Uh, but also there's the concept of do what you can. And we don't live in a community where we can all walk to school. And so we do what we can. 
106. 106. So I got you guys up too early, but you can, you can come up here anyway. Um, does anyone have any good news that they want to share with the congregation? Oh, absolutely. My granddaughter celebrated her first Shabbat, started last night. Awesome. And this is her first time in a messianic congregation. She's <laughs> full of questions. Okay. I'm going to ask a few of you the answers. May I ask, may I ask granddaughter's name? Uh, sure, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, later on, would you like to help us with part of our ceremony? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this? I'm going to call you up and you're going to help me. <laughs> I think you'll enjoy it. Um, all right, wonderful. Thank you. Just so everyone knows, that's Chuck. Oh, right? Yes, sir. And, yes. Our, and last week was your first week here? Yes, sir. Already bringing family. Wonderful. And, uh, Who else? Yeah. Um, I'll just say it's been... Oh, here. Uh, yeah, a couple weeks ago, we had that really bad windstorm. Yeah. And I saw trees through houses. Yeah. Literally 150 foot, three foot around pine trees crash diagonal through houses and take out the whole house. So I'm very, very grateful that we only lost power and we had a few shingles fly off and some branches, but a lot of people got it really bad. We have a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. Anyone else? Since we're talking about the storm, not even our trash can flew away. Yeah. I would see the neighbor stuff fly by, and I'm like, waiting, waiting. <laughs> Nothing blew away from our property. It was such a God is good. God is good. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. That you were able to um, make it here where we could come to the service without being late or anything like that and be able to celebrate Shabbat. Because, you know, let's be real, we take Shabbat for granted sometimes, but Shabbat was not always observable because of persecution or you fill the blank, a Holocaust, a pogrom. And so it's good that not only are we able to live in the day when we, we can observe the Shabbat, uh, the Shabbat but also a uh, day where we can come together and do in Gentile life. Because for a long time, that was also taught me. Actually, it's still taught me in a lot of parts of the world, but for us, we get to do it. Good. Anyone else? All right. Does anyone want to say the blessings? With so much freedom, we take it for granted. Yeah. So I want to say the blessings. I'll say it as long as it's not in Hebrew. You can say it in English. Okay, where is it at? Page 107. 107. Do I need to stand? or? Uh, you can stand. Okay, thank you, sir. Praise for you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who acts kindly toward the undeserving, and has dealt kindly with me. May the one who's bestowed goodness upon you to continue to grant you every is uh, Luke 6, 17 through 19. And coming down with them, he stood on a level place with the crowd and his taught ones and a great number of people from the from all Yehuda and Jerusalem and from the coast country of Zor and Zedon came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And all the crown crowd were seeking to touch him, for power went out from him, and healing from them, healing them all. Unless you have a copy of the prayer list. You know what? It's okay. 
we'll just do this thing informally. Yeah. I'm going to say a few names, then everyone else can say names when I point at you, okay? Just shout them out. Right. Page 109. May the holy blessing one who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless and heal. Yantan, Gail Renee, Michael, uh, Juanita, uh, Vicky, Tammy, Janelle, Shemai, Avi, Gabrielle, Gabrielle, Sanka, Robert and Emily, Robert and Emily, Pauline, Pauline. Rick. Rick. Sharon. Sharon. Oh, Sharon. Sharon. Shannon. Shannon. Lucas. Lucas. Heather. Penny. Heather and Penny. Jack. Jack. Martha. Gina. Martha. Father, we're offering that up for you. That is a, that's a list that you've heard all. May the Holy uh, One give them support, courage, and determination, and patience of spirit. Grant them physical and spiritual wholeness. May God and kindness strengthen and heal them, be your body and soul, together with others who are here. Let us say, Amen. 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 Page 110, responsive reading. Hear their voice, O God, when they call. Be gracious to them and answer them. Grant them patience, faith, and courage. Never let despair overwhelm them. Grant them of your healing power so that in vigor of body and mind they may return to their loved ones for a life of blessing and sustenance. Page 112. yeah, that, 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 that didn't happen because there weren't enough people to talk to the Torah reading. Sorry. Um. Torah, share some Israel. The Torah, which Moshe set before the Israelites to pass God's word, by Moshe's hand. And um, I'm going to ask Greg to hold the. Actually, can I ask Shannon to hold the Torah scroll for us? Uh, Shlomo Korobach, 
And he uh, he wrote that his the, like the first contemporary Hasidic singer. If you want an idea of who that is, and that's actually the melody of Hashivenu uh, Hashem uh, returned to us. Uh, Hashem, it's the last two lines of the uh, Etz Kaim He, and that's where we that's where he got that melody from. Um, before we get into today's Haftarah portion, I'd like to ask if anyone felt like this uh, dressing the Torah felt familiar. We put a vest on it with an opening. We put a breastplate on it. We put a crown on it. Where have we heard things like this before? And we all gather around to do it together. That's like the dressing of the Kohen Gadol. Uh, Kohen Gadol. Yeah, it's like the dressing of Aaron and his sons. And to understand that's where we get the image from. And now it's wearing a little vest. It's got a belt. It's got a breastplate. It's got a crown. Just like the high priest. And you can see what we're, we don't have Kohen Gadol anymore, but we have the Torah. So understand that's where we get a lot of our imagery from. It's from the Torah and it's kind of these Midrashic readings. Um, today, Let's go ahead just to page 14. Baruch Hukatah Hadanahai Elohim Melika Ulaham Asher Bakarvi Bito Vihim Ratsavi Tivrehem Van the Emarim Baemeh Baruch Hukatah Hadanai Haboker Batora Moshe Abdoho Israel Amo Uvin Vieha Hamet Besehede Praise our God, God, world universe, who has chosen good prophets and was pleased with their words that were spoken in truth. Praised are you, Adonai, who, um, who chooses the Torah of Moshe, your servant, and Israel, your prophets, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Um, and actually, I'm up here, and I realized I might have made a mistake, because the Torah portion I had planned for the day comes from, um, it, it, it's, it's not the Rosh Chodesh reading. Does anyone have a card before I start reading? No? Ezekiel? Um, it's Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel? Yes. Okay. That's the reading I had access to. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not usually up here by myself. 45 and 16. 46. That's what I had. Okay, 45, 16. So go ahead there now. Ezekiel 45, 16. Through 46, 18. 46, 18. Okay. Is it 45, 16? Yes. All the people in the land are to present this offering to the prince of Israel. The prince's obligation will be to present the burnt offering, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the feast on Rosh Kodesh and on Shabbat at all the designated times to the house of Israel. He is to prepare the sin offering, grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. Anai Elohim says this, On the first day of the month, you are to take a young bull without defect and purify the sanctuary. The Kohen will take some of the blood from the sin offering and put it on the door frames of the house on the four corners of the altar's ledge and on the supports of the gates of the inner courtyard. You are also to do this on the seventh day of the month for everyone who has sinned inadvertently or through ignorance. Thus you will make atonement for the house. On the fourteenth day of the first month, you are to have the Pesach, a feast seven days long, matzah will be eaten. On that day, the prince will provide for himself and for the, house, uh, for the people of the land a young bull as a sin offering. On the seventh day of the feast, he is to provide a burnt offering for Anais, seven bull, young bulls, and seven rams without defect, daily uh, for the seven days, and a male goat as a sin offering. He is to provide as a grain offering a bushel of grain for a young bull and a bushel for a ram, and for each bushel of grain a gallon of olive oil. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, during the Feast of Sukkot, he is to do the same thing for the seven days in regard to the sin offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, and olive oil. This is what Adonai Elohim says, the east gate of the inner courtyard is to be shut in, uh, on six day working days, but on Shabbat it is to be open, and on Rosh Kodesh, that is the new moon, it is to be open. The prince is to enter by the way of the outer vestibule of the gate and stand by the court of the gate. The Kohanim are to prepare this burnt offering and peace offerings, and he is to prostrate himself in worship at the threshold of the gate, after which he is to leave, but the gate is not to be shut until evening. The people of the land are also to prostrate themselves and worship for a night at the, present, at the entrance of the gates on Shabbat and on Rosh Kodesh. The burnt offering of the prince, to, the prince is offered to Adonai on Shabbat is to consist of six lambs without defect and a ram without defect. And grain, the grain offering is to be a bushel for the ram, while the lamb it, um, can be as much as he wants to give, with a gallon of olive oil per, ifa, uh, per effa. On Rosh Kodesh, it is to be a bull, go um, a young bull, six lambs, and a ram, all without defect. He is to prepare a grain offering consisting of a bushel for the bull, a bushel for the ram, and for the lambs as 
his means allow, with a gallon of olive oil per bushel. When the prince enters, he is to go in by way of the vessel of the gate, and he is to leave the same way. But when the people of the land come before Anai at the designated times, whoever comes is to worship by the way of the north gate, is to leave by way of the south gate. And whoever comes in by the way of the south gate is to leave the way by the way of the north gate. He is not to come back or uh, back out through the gates by which he has entered, but is to exit straight ahead of him. On these occasions, the prince is to be among them when they enter, and when they leave, they are to leave together. At the festival and at the designated times, the grain offering is to be a bushel for a young bull and a bushel for a ram. While the lambs, uh, while for the lambs, he can be as much as he wants to give, with a gallon of olive oil per bushel. When the prince provides a voluntary offering, whether it is a burnt offering or a peace offering, he is to offer that he offers voluntarily to Adonai. Someone is to open the east gate for him, and he is to provide his burnt offerings and peace offerings as he does what? on Shabbat. Then he will leave, and after he leaves, the gate is to be shut. You are to provide a lamb in the first year that has no defect for a daily burnt offering to Adonai. Do this each morning. Also, each morning, provide with it the grain offering, one-sixth of a bushel and one-third of a gallon of olive oil to moisten the fine flour. This is the ongoing grain offering to Adonai by a permanent regulation. Thus, they will offer a lamb, a grain offering, and oil uh, each morning as the ongoing burnt offering. And I, Elohim says, if the prince turns over part of his hereditary property to one of his sons, it is his inheritance. It will belong to his sons. If uh, it is their possession by inheritance. But if he gives part of the hereditary property to one of his slaves, it will be his until the year of freedom, at which it will revert to the prince, so that the prince's heritage will go to his sons. The prince is not to take over any of his people's inheritance, thereby evicting them wrongly from their property. He is to give his sons an inheritance out of his own property, so that none of my people will be driven off their property. Robert, do you have a break, Kadesha? As we get into this, it's, you see the obvious connections. There's Rosh Kodesh, which is the new moon today. We see themes of the temple, the future temple, Ezekiel's temple, relating to the Mishkan. And instead of talking about the Kohen Gadol being anointed, it's the priest being anointed. And instead of it being a hereditary priesthood, we're talking about a hereditary kingship and property that belongs to the king. Robert? Reading this morning from Marie Hadashah is taken from Luke 22. For those who'd like to follow along, I'm reading from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, beginning in verse 1. And reading through verse 13. Luke 22, verse 1. But the festival of Masa, known as Pesach, was approaching. And the hit Kohanim and the Torah teachers began trying to some, find some way to get rid of Yeshua because they were afraid of the people. At this point, the adversary went into Yehuda from Kiryat, who was one of the twelve. He approached the head Kohanim and the temple guard and discussed with them how he might turn Yeshua over to them. They were pleased and offered him some money. He agreed and began looking for a good opportunity to betray Yeshua without the people's knowledge. Then came the day of Matzah, on which the Passover lamb had to be killed. Yeshua sent Kepha and Yochanan, instructing them Go and prepare our Seder so we can eat. They asked him, where do you want us to prepare it? He told them, as you're going into the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to his owner, the rabbi says to you, where is the guest room where I might to eat the Pesach meal with my Talmudim? He will show you a large room upstairs, already furnished. Make the preparations there. They went and found things just as Yeshua had told them they would be, and they prepared for the Seder. Right, page 115. Praise God and our God, rule of the universe, rock, all worlds, righteous in every generation, the faithful God who says it, and it is done, who speaks, and it is fulfilled. For all God's words are truth and righteousness. You are faithful and our God, and your words are trustworthy. Not one of your words is ever taken back and fulfilled. For you are a dependable and merciful ruler. Praise you, God, and I, the God who is dependable in all your words. Have mercy on Zion, for she is our life's home, safe and hold soul quickly in our days. Praise you, God, and I, who causes Zion and her children to rejoice. 
Cause us to rejoice in our God, with Eliyahu the prophet, your servant, and with the kingdom of David, your anointing. May he quickly come and gladden our hearts. May no stranger sit in his throne. May no other inherit his glory. For you bow to him by your holy name, that his life may never be extinguished. Praise for you, the night shield of that hand. For your Torah, and for the worship, and for the prophets, and for the Shabbat day that you have given us. I know your God for holiness and for rest, for glory and splendor, for all these things. I know your God, we thank you and praise you. May your name be praised perpetually forever. Praise are you, Adonai, who sanctifies the Shabbat. Twenty-one. Page 121 is a prayer for our country. And there is a difference between reading a prayer or even repeating a prayer and praying a prayer. I have estimated, I think I mentioned it before, that I probably repeated what we know as the Lord's Prayer over 3,000 times before I ever prayed it the first time. There is a difference. And I ask you to not just follow this with me on page 121, this prayer for our country, but to pray this prayer with me. Our God and God of our ancestors, please accept with mercy our prayer for our land and its government. Teach our leaders the values of your Torah and help them understand your rules of righteousness so that our land may never lack peace and tranquility, prosperity and freedom. I don't know, God of the spirits of all flesh, send your spirit to all the inhabitants of our land and plant love and brotherhood, peace and friendship among all the nationalities and faiths who dwell in. A group from their hearts any hatred or enmity, jealousy or rivalry, to fulfill the yearnings of their children who delight in his honor and who desire to see it be a light for all the nations. May, May it be your will that our land will be a blessing to all the inhabitants of the world and that friendship and freedom will reign between them and that the vision of your prophets will soon be fulfilled. Amen. And on page 123, a prayer for the state of Israel. And again, Israel, like our own nation, stands in great need of prayer in these days and these hours. And I ask you to pray this prayer with me on page 123. Our heavenly parent, rock of Israel and its redeemer, bless the state of Israel, for the suffering of our redemption. Shield it unto your loving wings and spread over it your sense of peace. Send your light and truth to its leaders, ministers, and advisors, and guide them rightly with your good advice. Strengthen the hands of the defenders of our holy land and lead them, God, to deliverance. Crown their efforts with victory. Grant peace to the land and eternal happiness to its inhabitants. And let us say, Amen. 125. I'm sorry, can we tell them to go to the Rosh uh, Hashanah Today's a special day. Yeah. That was it? Yeah. yeah. 125. You hear what's on the Fanek Adonai Yahweh would tame you. May it be your will, Adonai our God, and God our ancestors, to renew this month for us for good and for blessing. Grant us a long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of good livelihood, a life of physical strength, a life in which we are, uh, uh, which we have will have reference for God and a revulsion for sin. Which will, um, a life which is free of shame and reproach, a life of wealth and honor, a life in which we will have love of Torah and the love of God, a life in which our worthies, in which our worthy hearts desires will be fulfilled, and then Selah. May the one who worked miracles for our ancestors and redeemed them from slavery to freedom soon redeem us and gather our exiles from four corners of the earth. All of Israel are friends, and let's say amen. 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 The new month of Nisan will begin. Um, uh, uh, well, it began this week. May what's that? It will begin on Thursday. May it be. It may bring goodness for us and for all the people of Israel. May the blessed one renew it for us and for all God's people of the house of Israel. For life and peace, Amen. For life and peace, Amen. For joy and gladness, Amen. For, and gladness, amen. for redemption and consolation, let us say, Amen. For amen. 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 All right.
page 128. So can I get someone to carry the Torah scroll for me? Yeah. All right, Eric. Yeshua, 
services, you'll see that. If you look at a lot of our weekday prayer meetings for our chakra, you'll see that. And if you um, even look at this morning, I started turning around the Bima facing the Aram Kodesh. It is only a matter of time before we start facing the Bima currently facing east. Um, eventually, I think it'll be down here at the floor level, but for now, we're keeping it here to keep it out of the way of the churches that rent from us. Um, just be aware. Um, that will change some of the, di of the dynamics, but it won't change much too much. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who is willing to hop, in, hop, up, hop up here on a short notice and help. Um, I think it's, we always have days like this where it's just kind of like, none of our regulars showed up and we'll see what happens. Um, and I just want to say thank you everyone for being very flexible. So let's go to Romans 12. We've been working from through 12, 9 through 21. And we've been going over what this means in the Messianic Jewish context. Don't let love be mere outward show, because love is infused with the mitzvot. Recoil from what is evil, cling to what is good. Those are part of the same mitzvah, two halves of the same mitzvah. Love each other devotedly and with brotherly love, because we're all family. Israel, we just read it for the Rosh Kodesh reading. All Israel is friends. Love each other with brotherly love and set examples with each other and showing respect, outdoing one another and showing honor. Don't be lazy when hard work is needed, but serve Hashem with spiritual fervor. Rejoice in your hope, be patient in your troubles, and continue steadfastly in prayer. And we spoke for about three, four weeks about prayer. And I said it in a teaching this week, and it's on Facebook and on Instagram. I really suggest you, you watch it. Not, I don't usually push my videos like that, but I suggest this one because it was just kind of a, a just. Like everything in here, just, I just kind of threw it at the screen. Because you see, I said what I want to be is a Messianic Jewish congregation built on mitzvot, good deeds, and prayer. And that's why I want constant prayer. Um, too many Messianic congregations are built around dance. And that's not bad, but it's not substance. And it's not even addressed in scripture. Not Definitely not the Greek kind of show. I said, can we just check our priorities and say, we are here for prayer and for doing good deeds rather than a lot of the things you kind of see a lot in Messianic Jewish congregations. The scars, the prayer flags. Share what you have with God's people and practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. This is a big one. Because, honestly, hospitality is a word that has basically left our vocabulary as people. Um, and just to give you some idea here, um, what was the big sin of Sodom and Amora? Right. When you have a guest, you should be like Lot, who welcomes them into your house. You shouldn't be like the men of Sodom who wanted to rape them. Okay, I feel like this is just good manners. And yet, <laughs> Yes. And yet the people of Sodom and Gomorrah completely, that, that wasn't completely, they missed it in grade school, I guess, I don't know what happened. Um, they were depraved. And in the ancient Jewish thought, sodomy, homosexuality, that was bad. But the real sin was how they treated visitors. And understand that Abraham was an incredibly hospitable man. In the previous story, he was still recovering from his circumcision. He was still recovering from his circumcision, and he looks up and he sees three visitors coming. And even though he's an old man and he's recovering from a physical ailment, he gets up, runs to them, bows, and then orders. Uh, he prepares some. Um, he, he prepares a, a dairy dish right there in front of them, and tells his wife, "Go get some meat ready for them." She slaughters it, cooks it. Understand that Abraham was a man who was hospitable. Messianic Judaism. We are a hospitable people. And they came and sat with him. And then they go into Sodom, 
and there it's almost a citywide rape fest on them. You see, the contrast between them was intense. And in the ancient world, this is much more pronounced. We focus on homosexuality, they focus on how do you treat visitors. And I say this not as a blanket statement against the Messianic Jewish world, because this has happened to me. Uh, the, the good thing, the welcoming. I went to Beth Manuel, and I got there a little bit later than I wanted to. It's a 12 hour drive, and I floored it. I tried to get there as quickly as possible. But the truth is I still got there an hour or two later than I expected. And they told me, they said, uh, did you prepare for Shabbos? And I said, not really. I got here later than I thought. I, I guess we'll just probably just go grab some food. It's not an already set. And they said, no, you can't do that. And they said, quick, someone, who's taking him to their house? And, and the cousin said, I I'll do it. And so I got to go to the cousin's house with him. I got to meet his kids, his wife. We sang songs around the table. We had kiddish together. Oh, that felt good, because if I'm going to make my pilgrimage to Beth Emanuel, I don't want to have to break the Shabbos, um, or at least I want to break it as little as possible. And they made sure that I did not have to, because they were hospitable. You see, I'm going to say something. I feel that in the Gentile world, the concept of hospitality is almost finished. And what made this so pronounced to me, what made this so pronounced to me, was the last time I went to um, West End Synagogue in Nashville. West End, conservative Jewish congregation, I went for Purim. It's a couple years back. And we were just sitting around, there's some drinking going on over there, there's someone reading the Megillah over there. We're, we're, it's a party, we're all eating, it's a good time. And three different families over the course of the evening met my family and said, if you ever come back, we have a guest room ready for you. And we'll have Kiddush with you. And we'll have the, like, we're going to take you into our homes. And they couldn't do that evening because they weren't prepared for visitors. But understand that of all the churches I've met in my entire, I've been into my entire life, no one has ever invited me into their home after Sunday. And no one has ever said, oh, you've come a long way. Let me give you a guest room. And to tell you the truth, we're at the point in the society where if somebody offered me their guest room, I'd probably likely decline and not want to come back. But understand that this is not a concept that is present anymore in the Christian world, even though it really should be. I came back to Karam Adonai, Karam Adonai at the time, and I shared my story. I said three families invited me to their home. I said, doesn't that put us, the Messianic Jewish world, to shame? And so they spoke from the congregation, and they said, well, that's their culture. <laughs> it should be, much more so, our culture. Because it is a mitzvah of Scripture. Scripture says, do not stop entertaining visitors, because some of you have invited angels into your home unbeknownst. And right here, do not stop showing hospitality. And I want to give you an example. Why are we showing hospitality? Why is this important? I'll tell you why. Because in our Torah portion this week, Hashem shows hospitality. Let me ask you a quick question. Who made this earth? Whose earth really is it really? Yes. Scripture says that you know the heavens belong to him and the earth man the earth belongs to man. But he made it. He made it for us. And he supplied it with every good thing that we could ever want. You know, weather breathable atmosphere, food, comforts galore, and beauty galore. But in this week's Torah portion, he has a house. He has an official house, the Mishkan. The Mishkan. And in his house, who are the visitors? I'm going to say, for the sake of this analogy, the Kohanim. And what does he do? He gives them clothing. He gives them Food, because understand, the Mishkan is their source of livelihood now. He gives them food, he gives them a room which smells nice, is pleasantly lit, and once a week they are able to ingest the food that comes from that room, the holy place. They have a job, but he is acting as a hospitable host. And just to emphasize what an absolute sin it is not to show hospitality, there is a character in history who greatly misused 
the base Hamikdash, the temple. What? Who misused the temple? Oh, that's good. I wasn't going that direction. Yeah, well, that's a whole new can of worms for all of them. I was thinking Caiaphas. What did Caiaphas do? Caiaphas had guards, like paid soldiers and servants, who would beat the Kohenim that worked under him, that beat them so that he could take their share of the sacrifice, of the sacrificial meat. So Caiaphas became fat while there were literal Kohenim working under him who were starving to death. They were starving to death. I sat under a Hasidic rabbi now, and he made mention that Caiaphas really was just an awful character according to history. And it's true. Caiaphas actually kept servants to make sure that his priests were beaten and that they were yielding their share of the prophets to him. He completely misused the Beis Hamidash, the, Beit Hamid, the, the temple. And what resulted? Rabbi Yeshua gave a parable. He said, Hashem, or you know, the master of a vineyard sent his messengers, and you killed them, and you beat them, and you mistreat them. And he said, So now the vineyard's going to be taken from you, the chief priest, and given to those who are more worthy. <clears throat> Probably yeah. the Pharisee party. The Pharisees were better than the Sadducees and the Kohen Gadol. The Pharisees were better than the chief priests. And he says, The vineyard yeah. Israel is being taken from you and given to those who are worthy. And it says the chief priest he was talking to knew he told this parable against them. And they were mad, and they go out and they plot to kill him. You see, Hashem was very serious about how his people were treated when they were in his house. And understand that he was a good host. And when his manager started misusing his house, there was wrath and there was judgment. Understand that this is the house of Hashem, that this is his space where he meets his people. And we come here to honor him, but we also recognize that when we enter here, he has already done great things to honor us. Think about it. He has treated us very, very well in his creation and in his Shabbat. Because understand that when we enter Shabbat, it's like we enter into a spiritual sanctuary. And he's given us rest and an extra measure of soul to be able to receive that holiness on the Shabbat. Understand that God has treated us well on his day in his house, as his people, as his guests, not only in the physical sanctuary, but in a sanctuary found in time. We're getting esoteric. Let's, let's reel this in. Understand that God practices hospitality. And in the ancient world, this was a given. Because you see, I didn't have email. I didn't have phone calls. I could, If I was going on a trip to a city, I could not make phone calls and make arrangements before I got there. Very often, I had to enter the city and find people to house me. And understand that in the ancient world, they developed a culture where this was absolutely necessary. You have to take in visitors because if you expect to be taken in, uh, you should be expected to be taken in when you go to a place as well. And this was practiced through the Middle Ages as well. When a merchant goes to a city, he immediately went to the, mer to the market, one way to sell his wares, but on the other hand, to make friends with other merchants. Because those merchants would say, oh, you're a merchant? Come into my house, we'll take care of you tonight. And a lord, he would go up to another lord and say, um, I'm in town. And the lord would say, oh, come into my castle tonight. You see, you stayed with like people. You stayed with your class. You stayed with your job. And they had to have that culture because otherwise you're sleeping outside, you're sleeping in the streets. We don't have that culture anymore. We can go to what, like Hotel Eight. We can we can we can go to like you know some sort of Marriott or some sort of motel. Uh, it depends where you are. But understand that the concept of hospitality still applies, and it really is found in the concept of how do you treat the stranger? How do you treat the stranger? How do you treat the visitor? Or, better yet, how do we treat the people who don't look like us, act like us, and don't fit in like us? Not only is this a problem for Western Christianity and Messianic Judaism, I would say this is a problem for the entire West. The issues of racial segregation and also the issues of immigration 
should have never entered the four walls of the sanctuary. It doesn't surprise me that it entered the world. That's that's the world. They're depraved. It shouldn't happen there, but it, it's not surprising. The sanctuary, God's people, the congregation, these issues should never be a problem. And yet very often I feel like it's the, and I'm, I'm referring to a broad church culture or southern culture, are sometimes the first ones to put up walls and say, oh no, please not people like them. I'm talking about people like, well, in a broad sense, I'm talking about like immigration. In a more <laughs> specific sense, I'm talking about people like, or just homosexual, or they live lifestyles that are different from us. They live non-saved lifestyles from us. Okay, understand, I'm not saying it's right to, I'm not supporting some of these lifestyles, but I am saying that there are people who are different than us, and we we throw them out. And instead, what I think we should be doing is saying, let me form a relationship. You want to come in here? We can be friends. You want to come in here? Okay, I understand it's not a place for practicing your immoral lifestyle, but understand that you yourself are welcome, and as long as we're here together, we can, in fact, get along. I had this issue just recently. Um, a homosexual uh, Jew came in with his boyfriend, and they worshipped with us. Uh, and, of course, I went throw them out. But they turned around and said, would you marry us? And I said, no. I said, you know, you're welcome. We, we don't recognize your lifestyle, though. And I just, I refuse. I say, the Torah defines marriage as a man and a woman. And the guy was from a Jewish background. He nodded me. He said he understood. He said he, you know, he... He understands he's in a world where that's not possible right now. And he said, well, he'll find someone else. I think he thought the Messianic rabbi was like already an outcast, so maybe like he would, two outcasts would join together. I said, no. Um, I answered to Yeshua. But guys, I will say this. The church culture has been very bad at starting conversations with sinners. We're very good at telling them they're going to hell. I'll, I'll grant you that we are good at that. Um, heck, I'm good at that. I'm not going to lie. For those of you who've been around, you know I've gotten a lot less scary with my presentation too. Um, I, I truly do come from a southernness, southern holiness like type of tradition in the shows. But guys, my question to you is: How are we treating people that we do not know? People who are not like us? People who come from a different background? And most of all. People who just don't have our relationship with God. Sinners are sinners. And rather than throwing people out and saying, I'm clean, maybe sometimes we need to be the ones saying, yes, that is unclean, but Yeshua has provided an answer for it. And that you are welcome to participate in him and to give up that lifestyle of sin. It's not always easy. But I am, I am saying we have done a very bad job at welcoming people to the us. And I'm thinking homosexuality is kind of like the hot topic of the day. Understand there's a lot of other issues, immigration being one of them, where I was shocked to see so many churches putting up walls and saying, we don't support immigration and we'll, take, we'll actually vote and take steps to make sure that immigrants are blocked. I'm not talking about the legal immigration. But let me ask you this question. The legal immigrant is here. What do you do to show them the love of the Messiah? Because Hashem brought them here. Guys, Israel was condemned for how it mistreated the ger. What is a ger? It's an immigrant. It's a sojourner. And Israel, it said that Israel treated them poorly and that it treated the poor for a pair of sandals. And God said, God started cursing all the nations around Israel. He curses them, curses them, curses them. Then he says, but may you, Israel, be especially damned because you traded the poor for a pair of sandals. He says, they worship idols. That's bad. They kill their children. Oh, that's bad. But you have mistreated the poor. And so God is going to especially destroy you. Why? Because the surrounding nations were non-believers. But God was looking at the people of Israel saying, look how you've treated the stranger and those who don't look like you. I feel like very often when I when I'm in conversations about talking, giving to the poor and that type of thing, people very often start coming up with excuses right away. Well, they're lazy, or well, there's opportunities. Well, how do we know? How do we know? And I'm like, I understand. But giving to the poor is still a commandment of Scripture. 
taking care of people who aren't like us, the stranger is still a commandment of scripture. And even though there are abuses, we have been told to be generous. We have been told to be generous. And so even though, even though there are abuses, and even though we can all think of excuses not to be hospitable or giving, at the end of the day, scripture looks at us and says, be welcoming, be generous. Because some of you have welcomed angels and not known it. Fun fact, I believe my family once welcomed an angel because he had a good way of disappearing and not leaving a trace of his presence. It still happens. It still happens. And I saw the guy. And uh, apparently he had such piercing blue eyes, you could see him from across the street while he looked and said, we gotta pick that guy up. And uh, he signed a guest book and everything uh, when we put him into a hotel for the night. And next morning, no one had seen him, no traces, gone. Um, what, if, wasn't there. what if we said, sorry, we don't pick up homeless people, or sorry, that's against the law. You know, we don't pick up hitchhikers. We would have missed out on a blessing because we had an amazing conversation. Understand that God, his eye is fixed on the outcast and the stranger and the sojourner. His eye is fixed on the heartbroken. His eye is fixed on those who suffer. And his eye is especially, his ear is especially attentive to their cries. So when it says, seek to show hospitality, it doesn't just say passively show hospitality. Oh, you're new, let's come, come to my house for half dollar or something. It says, seek to show hospitality. Go looking for an opportunity to show hospitality. I will say this. A couple months ago, I was giving a message, I was giving a series about, about a similar topic, about going to each other's homes and sharing life and breaking of bread and that type of thing, especially with believers. And uh, Tammy, you started taking people to your home for Kiddush. You started training them how to do it. Do you still do that? No, because I'm here. Wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. We started Kiddush here. She took the lesson and she ran with it. She took it to heart. How many of us took that lesson to heart and started taking people into our homes or at least showing them, hey, this is Kiddush, this is what we do, this is Havdalah. We have much to grow in, don't we? For me, it got harder when I moved 45 minutes away. <laughs> One more passage of scripture, then we're going to start closing out. Luke 14. So here, Messiah Yeshua is at the house of a Pharisee. And this Pharisee and Yeshua seem to get along pretty well. Um, Messiah Yeshua actually tells him a story about how to be great in the kingdom of heaven, which means this Pharisee is actually going to heaven. He's just telling him how to be great. But one Shabbat, Yeshua went to eat in the home of a leading uh, Pharisee, Pharisee, and they were watching him closely. In front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. Yeshua spoke up and asked the Torah experts and the Pharisee, does the Torah allow for healing on Shabbat or no? But they said nothing. So taking hold of him, he healed him and sent him away. To them he said, Which of you, if a son or an ox falls into a well, will hesitate to haul him out on Shabbat? And to these things they could give no answer. So wait a minute, what is Shabbat for? Healing other people and taking care of them. But it goes on. When Yeshua knows that the other guests were choosing for themselves the best seat at the table, he told them this parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't sit down in the best seat. Because if someone more important than you has been invited, the person who invited both of you might come and say to you, give this man your place. Then you will be humiliated as you go and take the least important place. Why is this being brought up? Because understand that Shabbat is always an analogy of marriage. Shabbat is an analogy of marriage. So understand, of course he's logically going to a marriage parable now. And he says, take the least seat. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. So Shabbat is a time for humbling yourself. Yeshua also said to the one who invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, or rich neighbors. Four categories, don't invite them. For they may well invite you in return, and then you have your repayment. Instead, when you have a party, invite poor people, disfigured, crippled, and the blind. How blessed you will be when, you have no when they have nothing with which to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, so now Shabbat is a time for taking people into your home that cannot repay you. So it's a time for healing, because this is Shabbat. It's a time for humbling yourself. It's a time for taking people into your home. 
And then on hearing that someone said, contentment awaits him, or how blessed is everyone who hear, uh, who eats bread in the kingdom of God. And then he gives a parable about how people didn't make time for the master. And so the master started inviting everyone else. And understand, in context, I believe he's, the, what the master does is he invites these exact people into his banquet hall, the blind, the crippled, the lame, the disfigured. Because some people saw themselves as unworthy to enter into the master's banquet hall. On Shabbat, if we do not act appropriately, we can null and void the wedding invitation that we receive every week. I know that's not what's being done here, but bear with me. I think that we don't read this in the context of a Shabbat discourse. We don't adequately humble ourselves. We don't adequately take care of people. We don't invite them into our homes. We don't show hospitality. I'm not even saying invite them into your home. I just mean be friendly to the stranger. Be friendly to people who look who don't look like us, who act different, that don't fit into our worldview. Because this is the purpose of Shabbat. This is the purpose of Shabbat. It's to take to humble yourself and to take care of other people. We talk about Shabbat being a time of rejoicing. We talk about Shabbat being a time of rest and holiness, and it's all of those things. But it's supposed to be a time when we are literally doing tikkun olam, fixing the world by reaching out to people who are not like us, who are showing hospitality. I'm not going to lie to you. I have a lot to grow in in this one. Partway because I live 45 minutes away, and I'm not sure how to make this work. But very often what I do is I invite them to phone in. I invite them to come talk with us. I invite people. I invite them to further services, prayer meetings. I give them our schedule. These are my strategies. And if you happen to live up in my neck of the woods, some of them do. Then I'll say, okay, why don't you come with us and we can have Havdalah together or Kiddush or something like that. Because understand, this is probably a this is probably a Kiddush meal right here. And you should just tell these parables saying, this is how you behave on Shabbat. This is the way you carry yourself. This is the purpose of Shabbat. Healing and humbling, and making friends that don't look like you and can't repay you. How many of us hear this and we're already starting to feel a little bit convicted? <laughs> Man, I'm preaching at the mirror today. Who are those people? Who are those people that don't look like us and that we naturally want to put a barrier against? And then my question is how can we start fixing the world? How can we start practicing our tikkun law? How can we start practicing our hospitality? I can't tell you. All I can do is give you my strategies. Invite people to Kiddush, Havdalah. Invite people during the week. Invite them to pray with you. For me, this is the real essence of Messian Judaism. It's the mitzvot. It's the good deeds. It's practicing hospitality. There's no God like our God, there's no like our sovereign, there's no like our ruler, there's no like our deliverer. Who's like our God, who's like our sovereign, who's like our ruler, who's like our deliverer? Let us thank our God, let us thank our sovereign, let us thank our ruler, let us thank our deliverer. You're the one to whom the ancestors offered the incense offering. Amen. Page 164. Go ahead and stand up with me. 
Stand up and say this with me. Would anyone like to say insanity? We can do it in English, and I can read it in English. I will. Let's do this one in Hebrew, but then we can do it in English. All right. I'll do it. Yigda Vikrash, Shmei Rabba, Bamandi Barak, your date, Yelim of Tev, and Kayyipot of Yalakon, and Kayyipot of Israel, like a lot of Yigma Kari, Amen. Amen. Yehei, Shmei Rabba, Barak, Barzamei, Layab. Amen. <laughs> Is it okay for me to read it now? I thought you were going to do it in Hebrew. Oh, I did. You did. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I I'll, I'll, I'll do it in English. Is that what you're saying? Do it in English? No, no, sir. You don't have to do that. Huh? Okay. Well, I'll read the last parts. Okay. May there be abundant peace from heaven, like for us in the world, so I'll say amen. 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 When he makes peace in the high places, make peace for us in the world, so I want to say amen. 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 All right. Your own work for this week. Go out into this week. It's a beautiful week. It's a beautiful day. In the grace and peace of our Master, Yeshua the Messiah. Enjoy his presence. But seek to show hospitality. I'm not going to tell you what it's going to look like. I'm not going to tell you where you're going to find people to be hospitable. But I believe that if you pray for it and you truly seek it, the Lord will honor you and He'll give you people to be hospitable towards you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Seek to show it. I'll see you next week. Yeah. There's no Hebrew today after the service, but it will be next week, lesson seven. Not because he said, Well, I'll follow the page back there. Okay. Well, we normally we have Hebrew lessons. Yeah.